Who is giving your children food that rats won't eat? Hi, I'm Don Fitz. I'm host of Green Time. This episode, we have with us uh, Daniel Romano, also known as Digger. And we're going to be talking about genetically modified food. But before we get into, these, into the, uh, the topic, let's take a look at a recent DVD by Jeffrey Smith, who talks about some of the issues of, and problems of genetically engineered food. The following keynote speech took place at the Weston A. Price Foundation Conference in November 2008. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Smith. Thank you, Sally, and all of Weston A. Price Foundation. What a magnificent environment you give us to have fun in. Thank you so much. We are all activists. How many people consider themselves foodies? Yes, yes. All right, here's a loaded question. How many people have convinced several others to change their diet? <laughs> Over 50? Over 1,000? <laughs> yes. We are, you know, the seed crystal. In nature, there's the seed crystal that changes the entire structure of the organism or organization. And I'll tell you, with the genetically engineered foods, the seed crystal is planted and it's moving. We have a phenomenal opportunity over the next 14, 15 months to kick GMOs out of the food supply. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know from whence I speak. Genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. Remember that? Well, it will soon be history. Yes. In March of this year, Walmart said, no more RBGH in our milk. Starbucks, Kroger's, Publix, at least 40 of the top 100 dairies so far. So what happened? The seed crystals at work. It turns out, others call a tipping point. A small percentage of consumers changing brand choices based on information. All of a sudden, using a product becomes a marketing liability, and it moves the market. So if you look at the actual New York Times reports and the Washington Post and the Boston Globe, they talk about tipping point. They talk about explosion in the industry. How did this arise? Well, it turns out a few of us did it on purpose. <laughs> it was no accident. We simply had to explain, oh yeah, that milk, the one with more pus. <laughs> Oh, and more antibiotics, and more bovine growth hormone, and more IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. You know, the stuff where if it's in high levels in your blood, it increases cancer and incidence of fraternal twins. Oh, that milk. You want that milk? <laughs> so we started spreading it around, writing about it in books, giving PowerPoint presentations, having postcards go to different dairies, and the tipping point was reached about two and a half years ago. Tillamook, the largest cheese, second largest cheese, cheese chunk producer in the United States, went RBGH free, and then it was like the domino effect, and we're still watching it. And three weeks ago, Monsanto finalized its sale of its bovine growth hormone to Elanco, Eli Lilly's uh, veterinarian division, because Monsanto realized the days of bovine growth hormone are over. Yeah. Let's give us some. All right. So we've got the formula. We know that we can convince a small percentage of consumers to change their brands, and the tipping point happens. So what about genetically engineered foods? What is going to cause Kraft or Nestle's 
or Hershey's to hold on to its genetically engineered corn? Very little. There's no consumer benefit. Not a single one. Not like trans fats, which gives you something, and aspartame, which theoretically gives you something and takes a lot away. There's no consumer benefits to GMOs. You can change to non-GMO without even changing the formula for your product. Just switch to the non-GM corn, the non-GM soy. So if we get about, let's say, 5% of U.S. consumers, 15 million people, avoiding brands that contain genetically engineered foods, I think that's more than we need to get Kraft and Hershey's and Nestle's and McDonald's and others to switch to non-GM because they'll see a reduction in their market share, they'll see a trend, and they'll simply tell their supply chain, use the non-GM varieties. You know, when the tipping point was hit in Europe in April of 1999, within one week, virtually the entire food supply in Europe all the major manufacturers committed to remove GM ingredients for Europe. But those same companies feed us GMOs because in the United States we haven't hit the tipping point. And part of the reason we haven't hit the tipping point is that people don't really understand what products are GM, what products are genetically modified. There's no labeling here. And CBS New York Times poll this year said that if GMOs were labeled, 53% of Americans would not eat them. If one in 10 of those, if nine out of 10 of those people were lying, it's still enough to hit the tipping point. So we just need to give the information about which products are GM and which products are non-GM and add a little bit of motivation by describing how eating a genetically engineered corn chip might turn your intestinal flora into living pesticide factories. <laughs> so we've created the Campaign for Healthier Eating in America, whose slogan is, healthy eating starts with no GMOs. So all you foodies out there, this is your mantra this year coming. So you have all these things to give to all of your friends and your devotees and your patients. And you want to talk about raw milk and you want to talk about soy. But healthy eating starts with no GMOs. Because by the end of next year, we expect to hit the tipping point. And we're going to do it here. Now... We have created non-GMO education centers, and on the top of that are non-GMO shopping guides, which list the brands that are non-GM and list samples of products that are GM, and also describes how you can evaluate a product by reading the ingredients and looking at the, at the packaging to determine if it's GM or not. So we are giving. We're not waiting for the government to label. We'll do it ourselves. And we're going to put these non-GMO, we are already putting these non-GMO education centers in natural food stores around the country. So if you meet me after the talk over there, you all get your free non-GMO shopping guide. You all get your health risks brochure, which encourages you to use the shopping guide. For those of you that are doctors, we have a package for your patients. And we're putting it out through many different organizations in electronic form, in physical form. We expect to distribute the shopping guide totally in the tens of millions next year. So we are going to do what people have been sort of, we've been whining about this for 12 years, waiting for the government to do it for us. What a waste of life. <laughs> what a waste of life. I'll tell you, by the way, Obama says he's going to label genetically engineered foods. He says that. Let's hear it. Yeah.
I'm not going to wait, though. <laughs> How do we avoid GMOs? Four ways. By organic, by products that, are, that say non-GMO, by products listed on a non-GMO shopping guide, or avoid the at-risk ingredients. Now, what are the at-risk ingredients? For the crops, there are four major GM crops. Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Everyone, soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Now, what are vegetable oils made out of generally? Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Another excuse to avoid vegetable oils. OK, minor food crops. Hawaiian papaya, zucchini, crookneck squash, a tiny percentage of the GM crops out there. And also, unfortunately, starting this year, the sugar supply in the United States will be genetically engineered from sugar beets. So this is the first new crop introduced in a long time, so we have to move quickly. We don't have time to waste. OK, everyone raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand. Thank you all for volunteering to do more <laughs> on the GMO issue. And you will know how to do it within an hour, and it'll be easy and fun and successful. Remember RBGH? Well, your children won't. Have you become a part of Missouri Renewable Energy or American Renewable Energy? Your gift enables 24.2 to stay on the air. It keeps the American Renewable Energy website at www.americanrenewableenergy.org going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So for as little as $8.80 a month or $25 for three months. And once we receive that $25 gift, we're going to send you a free DVD called The Creation of Electricity. A total of $100 a year enables you to attend classes and much, much more. For all the information, call now, 314-881-3213. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz, and with me I have uh, Daniel Romano, also known as Digger. Digger, glad you could join us for the show. Great to be here again, Don. Okay, uh, we're, and we are going to discuss some of the issues about genetically engineered food, especially some of the things that Jeffrey Smith talked about in the, in the DVD that we just saw. Um, Digger, one of the things that Jeffrey Smith did not cover because it was too recent, it was done after he made that DVD, was the whole issue of genetically engineered alfalfa. D do you know what's been happening with alfalfa and what that means for people who eat food? Sure. Um, what's happened is very recently is that a lower um, federal court um, issued a national ban on the planting of uh, genetically modified alfalfa. So I guess somebody was concerned about it. Uh, as they should be. Right. And the reason is because there was no environmental impact study done. And of course, on very few of genetically modified crops is there an environmental uh, impact studies done. And so Monsanto has uh, appealed this to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and that will be held, you know, listened to sometime. But the, the point is, is that Monsanto always goes on about how, you know, they're scientifically proven that their crops are safe. Uh, well, uh, environmental impact statements and things of this nature, this is standard science. Why is Monsanto opposed to it? Why yeah, it are they opposed to good science? Yeah, it seems really odd that you would say, okay, we should be able to introduce this crop. We don't know what, it, what effect it will have on other species. We don't know what effect it will have on the crop. And we don't, we don't want to find out. We don't want to have any sort of impact statement whatsoever. That seems really weird. Well, you know, Monsanto has a lot of um, influence over the FDA. And a matter of fact, the FDA has... F it, FDA stands... The Food and Drug Administration, okay. of course, U.S. Food and Drug. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, a sort of what they call the revolving door policy, where Monsanto employees have worked for the F FDA. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, in effect, this is why genetically modified foods have not been tested by the FDA. And, and the most famous one of those is Mike Taylor. Exactly. And then what, what, what was Mike, it? He was a Monsanto attorney. Yeah. He was a Monsanto vice president. And he also worked in a high-level position for the Food and Drug Administration. And he is the one that said, oh, well, uh, genetically modified foods are substantially equivalent to uh, standard foods, so they don't need to be tested. And, and in fact, the FDA has only looked at uh, testing that has been done by Monsanto and other uh, GMO, genetically modified organisms, um, you know, companies that market these products. So he, he said that while he was 
head of the FDA. Exactly. And he's, but before he worked for the FDA, he worked in as an for, attorney for, and, and, and as then a vice president. A, then after he left that position, he went back to work for Monsanto again. Exactly. And that's what we mean by revolving door. Mm-hmm. Now, now tell me uh, something else. Um, what about sugar beets, Roundup Ready sugar beets? Is that, is that going to be, an, uh, or, or that is an issue already, isn't it? Yes. Well, right now there are four main crops that are genetically modified, and that mm-hmm. is um, soy, mm-hmm. corn, uh, canola, and cotton. Right. And it's been that way for a while, actually. Uh, sugar beets have just recently um, been approved by the FDA to be planted in the farm, again, without any sort of testing or safety overview. Um, and the uh, Center for Food Safety, the one who brought the case with the alfalfa and obtained the ban by the lower federal court, is now saying we should do the same thing for the sugar beets. Before they're introduced, there should be an environmental impact statement. There should be a safety overview. And, of course, Monsanto is fighting that tooth and nail. That's one of the things that Jeffrey Smith comes... I mean, there's one, uh, the video that we just saw before, and then we're in future Green Time shows, we're going to see more of that discussion by Jeffrey Smith, who really explains the science very well. But that's one of the things he says is that there's a lot, uh, uh, sometimes the animals turn their noses up at it. Rats, what, rat, rats won't eat some of the There's been numerous studies mm-hmm. and, and, and sh- to show that, you know, um, animals reject this and rats that have been fed in the famous Arpad Pustai study mm-hmm. in the UK. That was potatoes, wasn't it? That was potatoes and the rats came up with lesions and all sorts of damage to mm-hmm. their stomach and other internal organs. Uh, there's been scientists that have observed that mice will reject genetically mm-hmm. modified corn and go for the traditional corn sitting right next to it. So, well, what, One of the uh, issues that's brought up a whole lot is uh, BT. What, you remember what BT stands for? Yeah, Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, that, what, that's been used for a long time. Organic farmers have used BT, and they would spray it on their crops. And so, S- uh, so, sure. so now they've genetically engineered it. So is there any reason to think that it's, if it's been used for so long, wouldn't it be safe to go ahead and start using it on crops? Well, remember that um, farmers would use the BT uh, sparingly. When, where there was a problem, they would mm. spray it on the crop. Mm. And then, of course, a lot of it is washed away, though not all of it, um, during the growing season. The difference is when you genetically modify corn, say, to put it in there, every cell of the plant has the BT in it. And that means you're, so uh, consumers are now eating a lot, large amounts of the BT. And there's been no long-term studies to see what is done, what this does. And there have been scientific evidence that this is dangerous to humans. Now, it, if you, of course, if you spray the BT on the plant, then when you get the plant, you can wash it off. Exactly. But or about- during the growing season, a rain could wash it off. But, but what about when it's inside the cell structure of the plant? There's no way. It's, it's in there, and when you eat the target plant, um, corn being probably the biggest one, mm-hmm. uh, you're eating it. Every cell of the plant has it in there. And, of course, it's, it's engineered to be a lot more toxic, isn't it, than the BT? So the, the BT that we get, uh, that, that organic farmers have used, has been a smaller amount of BT. Much smaller. Another thing is is that because they're using such heavy amounts in it, in the genetically modified plants, Mm. and it's in every cell, we already see uh, insects growing resistance to the BT. Oh, yeah, that's one thing. So in the long term, um, insects, it will become totally useless. So how does that work? Why do you say that insects are developing resistance? What would happen? To my understanding, Mm. all pesticides that you use, no matter natural or unnatural, insects will you know, because they breed so rapidly, um, can, you know, become resistant to it because they, the ones that don't die will breed and reproduce and pass it on to future generations. Mm-hmm. So, um, but the thing is, is with BT, the way it was used, as you described, mm-hmm. it was only used sparingly. And so, in fact, it would take a long time for the insects to develop a resistance to it. Right, but with the really high concentrated BT, there might, whatever it is that eats the corn or eats the cotton or whatever it is that you're trying to protect the, the plant from, if you have like a million or 500 million of the insects eating it and you have only 10 
that are naturally resistant to Bt, of course, those are going to be the ones that reproduce. So your next, exactly. next, so your next generation, you might have killed the vast majority, but your next generation. And so, so this has happened to, to, with other pesticides before. Exactly, and it's already happening with Bt. And then what will happen? They'll have to come up with an even more toxic pesticide to either spray or genetically engineer into the plants, mm -hmm. and we'll be eating even uh, stronger poisons. Yeah, the, there, there is an article in Scientific American that I read, it was uh, the latter part of 2009, that where they, uh, the authors of Scientific American interviewed several corporate heads about using a genetically engineered crops. And one of the things they said is that you want to use genetically engineered crops because that allows you to use fewer pesticides. D do you think that's a good argument? That's a deceptive argument mm -hmm. because, in fact, with the BT, uh, since it's in every cell of the plant, you're actually using more pesticides. And I've talked to farmers that, even though they have the BT crops, still, in some cases, have to use other pesticides too. So mm -hmm. I think this is a sham argument that uh, these GMO uh, corn and other crops that are, you know, have the BT in it reduce the use of pesticides. Yeah, it, it does seem really odd to me that somebody would make the argument that we got to produce more BT plants because we want to have fewer pesticides. Mm -hmm. And it's like we want to have more pesticides so we have fewer pesticides. So what, what they're basically saying is that if you spray pesticides on a plant, it's bad, but if you put it inside the plant, then it doesn't count. Exactly. And another thing that happens with farmers mm -hmm. with the BT is they're supposed to, whenever they plant like uh, BT corn, mm -hmm. they're supposed to have a buffer crop around mm -hmm. it. So, and this is to help um, you know, slow down the development of resistance in the bugs. Right. Well, what we're finding is that most farmers aren't doing that. They're planting all their acres in the BT corn. And then, so what's this going to do? It's going to, again, speed up the resistance in bugs to this. And then BT, this, you know, that has been used for so long will be useless. And as I say, what will happen? Stronger pesticides. Yeah, that, so, that, you know, that, I was that, just going to say, in the long run, what's going to happen is that it's promoting um, even more usage of pesticides. This will happen, and even stronger pesticides. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's a really good point is the effect that it has on organic farmers. Because organic farmers have been trying to avoid, the, the, the natural pesticides are something that occurs in nature, and the synthetic pesticides, they're usually things from petrochemical products. And mm -hmm. you add something like chlorine, or what are some of the other things? You I think they put phosphorus in some. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and so you put these chemicals in, then you get something very deadly, but BT occurs naturally. And so organic mm -hmm. farmers would, would use that but then what you're saying will be the case that they won't be, it will damage the ability of organic farmers to use BT in the future. Exactly, exactly. And then also, of course, there's a whole issue of pollen drift, that the um, pollen from mm -hmm. like uh, GMO corn mm -hmm. can drift for miles and contaminate mm -hmm. the crops of organic farmers. And if that, so, you know, how can they say it's organic if there is genetically modified cells in it. Okay. okay, well some of the arguments that are made in favor of genetic engineering is that it's really helpful to deal with major issues of food in the world. One is drought. If you have a really dry area, then you can genetically engineer a crop to be resistant to drought. Another is if you have children who have, are deficient in vitamin A, you can genetically engineer rice to have extra vitamin A. So what do you think about th these ideas that genetic engineering can really be helpful in solving a lot of the age-old problems that, f uh, that people have? Well, of course, these are um, arguments by Monsanto, the major mm -hmm. producer of genetically modified crops in the world. Mm -hmm. And yes, they'll sit there and uh, talk about how, oh, we're going to save the world. We are going to develop drought-resistant seeds and mm -hmm. vitamin A rice, and mm -hmm. as if there never were drought-resistant seeds, as if they are the only ones that can provide vitamin A. Mm. But in fact, for example, with the vitamin A, there's plenty of sources of vitamin A if people will simply get enough of a varied diet. They is, don't it, is, it, is it in leafy vegetables like spinach? Exactly. Okay. Uh, and also um, squashes and other yellow uh, vegetables too. Mm. So we don't need genetically modified crops to provide people 
with vitamin A. And as far as drought resistant, there are drought resistant seeds out there that have been developed by farmers in different countries and cultures that work very effectively. Mm. We don't need uh, genetically modified seeds to get these results. These things already exist that, you know, through traditional breeding methods. Okay. We only have, I think, a couple of minutes left, but I did want to ask you one question. A lot, the argument which I hear a lot is that there's four million farmers in India who choose to use genetically engineered cotton. Doesn't that mean that we would be taking away people's freedom of choice if we restricted genetic engineering? Well, genetically modified cotton in mm. India has been a disaster. And if mm. you look into it, you'll see. Mm. For one thing, it's the um, animals that have eaten it, the livestock like mm. sheep and water buffalo that they raise. Have been, have, there have been lots of deaths that have been directly attributed to those animals eating genetically mm. modified crops. Also, many farmers, to uh, Indian farmers, to get these uh, genetically modified seeds, they have to pay a lot of money. It's really expensive because you're... It's very expensive, and uh -huh. you have to sign a technology agreement mm. with Monsanto. You have to pay per acre. You have to use the specific chemicals mm. like Roundup. So you don't just buy the seeds, you buy the chemicals that go with the seeds. Yes, you, it's a whole package and you mm. sign a contract and Monsanto is very strict about enforcing the contract. So what we've seen is a lot of farmers in India have gone to, uh, into debt and there's been a rash of suicides among these farmers. Thousands of farmers in central India have killed themselves after accumulating a debt and feeling there's no way out, they feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. It's been devastating on the community. I would say that BT cotton has been nothing short of its disaster in India and in most places in the world where it's been used. Okay, I think we just got a little bit less than a minute left. Is there anything that's really important about the whole issue of genetic engineering that, that you could say in wrapping up? Well, I think the main thing is is that, again, Monsanto always or, uh, argues that the science on the, is on their side, that it's safe. But when you look into the science with uh, an unbiased eye, you'll see that there's lots of evidence that it's not safe and that consumers agree. Mm -hmm. uh, consistently, I've seen poll results showing consumers don't want it. Right in the middle of a sentence, but Daniel Romano, Digger, I want to thank you for showing up to Green Time, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Green Time, and be sure to look at the next episode.